It's almost 11 a.m. in Singapore and Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. Here are the top stories. More recent data show solid growth and continued strength in the labor market, but also a lack of further progress so far this year on returning to our 2% inflation goal. Hawkish comments by Fed Chair Powell hitting sentiment in equities. He signaled that the wait for a rate cut could get longer. New Zealand's inflation slows, but price pressures persist. We hear from the country's prime minister, who's touting fiscal restraint to rein in prices. And we meet the man helping Indian billionaire Mukesh Ambani build a media empire that could dominate the $28 billion industry in India. Let's get you to markets after five days of losses. Well, Asia looking pretty flat still, set to erase all gains for the year. Traders recalibrating expectations after Powell said higher for longer, given three sets of hotter than expected eco data. Markets now pricing cuts of about 40 basis points. The MSCI Asia Pack index, well, trying to be in the positive, but not really. The dollar index, 1264. Yields surging in Asia, tracking treasury yields overnight. New highs for 2024. Twos touched five tens at 465. The move index expected treasury volatility at the highest level this year. It is about the strong dollar story. It is taking a breather today, a relief for Asian currencies, but USD remains elevated. Yen traders say 160 is next. Yuan fixed steady, but today it has room to head lower. Peso falling past 57. That is the lowest level since November 2022. And we talk about Fed Chair Jerome Powell. This was what he had to say. Take a listen. We'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. The recent data uh, have clearly not given us greater confidence and instead indicate that it's likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. Right now, given the strength of the labor market and progress on inflation so far, it's appropriate to allow restrictive policy further time to work and let the data and the evolving outlook guide us. The performance of the U.S. economy over the past year has really been quite strong. Come what may, we remain strongly committed to returning inflation over time sustainably to 2%. All right, let's put it all in perspective and see how markets are digesting this. Let's bring in Wei Fok Hao, CIO of DBS Bank, also joining us, M Life Executive Editor Mark Cardmore. Uh, Wei Fok, let's start with you. Mark says no lending, no rate cut this year. You say still two. Yeah, I think uh, we will gravitate towards what the Fed is guiding us to rate cuts. Uh, well, growth has been pretty strong, uh, but we think uh, you know the full impact of that 500 basis points of rate hikes uh, from a year or two ago, from zero to uh, five and a quarter, I think that full impact will be felt later this year. And that would, uh, that would kind of uh, guide the Fed to, to really relax somewhat. Yeah. So what would it take to fully price out the rate cuts and for Mark to be right? Well, Mark is of the view that there will be rate hikes, right? <laughs> I think we'll get to a world where we start considering the idea of rate hikes. Uh, so I think it, that at the moment, there's no sign of disinflation. Even Powell's admitting that, and he's the biggest dove in the world. So there's no sign of disinflation. The economy is really strong. The labor market's really strong. So I just don't, I, I think we're going to get to a scenario where we at least consider rate hikes. Whether they're delivered or not is different. But I think, you know, it's not even, uh, not even near close to the time where you start fighting this kind of move up higher in yields. And I think that's the issue. So I'm curious, if you think two cuts till this year, when do you think the first cut comes, if you think we're going to get two? Well, probably, and what yeah. is going to justify it by then? Is it a, a sharp economic slowdown? Or where is this magical disinflation coming from to allow that first cut? <laughs> <laughs> it would be the second half, obviously, and there should be some signs of slowdown. But really, if you kind of look at US, you can't kind of look at it in isolation. It's part of the whole ecosystem of the world economy. And if Japan and European central bank rates are, are coming down, it's hard to see the Fed kind of, uh, you know, go all in in terms of more rate hikes, having already done 500 over basis but points. It may not, OK, that's not for more hikes, but why will it cut? I mean, it doesn't have an international mandate. It doesn't have to worry about the rest of the world. It is the most important central bank in terms of monetary policy. It controls basically the finance and the system. And its economy is still strong. I get your point that ultimately a strong dollar is deflationary, but we're seeing no sign of that yet. And like the Fed has repeatedly been wrong for the last few years. Uh, and so 
can it risk making this error the third time again? So the Fed controls the short end of the market through its Fed funds uh, uh, policy. But uh, it could be a situation where the dollar becomes a lot stronger, you know, because of the reassessment of the trajectory of rate cards, as well as long-term yields may actually go up. So that could also be a deflationary force. And uh, given that inflation hopefully is not going to kind of rear its ugly head and go above 3%, 2+, I think uh, there is room for the Fed to, to ease off somewhat. Yeah. So no agreement when it comes to cuts or not, but there is agreement that yields are trending higher. And Mark, you say that there is room, a lot of room for yields to go up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the long end will go higher. I think we're going to see 10-year yields easily above 5%. I think the neutral rate is much higher than people have considered the last few years. Um, and I think we're, we're going to a world of generally higher yields at some point. I said, I'm not, you know, whether we get actually hikes next or cuts at some point in the cycle, I don't know. But there's no justification for cuts anytime soon. The only way we're going to get those cuts is because we see some severe slowdown in the economy. And, and, and none of the, th the risks we're talking about at the moment are going to provide that. They're not systemic enough. Whether it's regional banks, there's going to be problems not systemic. Commercial real estate, not systemic. So it needs to be something, some true black swan that's going to derail that, or it's going to take time. I take your point that like a stronger dollar will ultimately be deflationary, but that's a dynamic for next year. We're, we're nowhere close to that scenario right now. So I think yields are going much higher first. Where are yields at it? Tens, twos, and also what's neutral? The new so, neutral. So yeah, we think, uh, you know, the slower they kind of, uh, you know, uh, cut rates, the, the, the more the long end of the yield curve will go up. And that's also due to a lot of supply of treasuries. So that's going to put upward pressure on long-term yield. So the curve will steepen uh, as they start, of, you know, start to kind of cut slowly. The curve will steepen. So from a portfolio construction perspective, uh, you know, we are comfortable. We're actually quite uh, you know, happy that it's long, higher for longer because uh, you know, the way we kind of guide our clients, the private wealth clients, is really to deploy your excess cash to work today because, you know, the way we do it is like, you know, on the income generation part of the portfolio, buy into three to five year investment grade bonds that is giving you north of 6% yield. So that is an anchor for your portfolio. And really, even if the Fed were to raise rates as Mark would contend it would, it's okay because you're on the short data, there's a pool to par anyway. So you're locking in 6% or plus. 6%. So that's but in terms of stocks, good. where do you deploy your money? Because higher yields usually would hurt stocks. We have seen that happen and that is to be expected. How do you deploy your, your money? Yeah, we think uh, what we have seen in the stock market uh, last year was really driven by technology. We think there is going to be a broadening of the rally. Now, technology will still be our structural overweight because you know of the secular growth trends, AI and, and, and what have you. Uh, but we think other sectors uh, where the price to earnings ratios are really very reasonable. And you exclude technology, actually the stock market is not really in a bubble stage. For example, financials are trading at 10, 12 times price to earnings, energy too. So we actually like some of these sectors, in particular energy. And Mark, you're liking stocks. You say, never mind, if you are headed higher, stocks the way to go. Yeah. No landing bull market. I'm completely with you on the bottom. <laughs> Finally, no, it's no fun talking about what we agree on. We, we're both, you know, absolutely <laughs> bullish all year, and I agree with him the broaden the rally. I tell you. I want to know about how far it's going to broaden because one part I've got wrong is I thought it would go to emerging markets at some point. Uh, I have been wrong on the going to the Hong Kong stocks. That's clearly not worked. And I do kind of think that you know things like Brazilian stocks sh just looked exceptionally discounted now. They've got the whole commodity story. They've got a good growth story. And yet they're really seeing no benefits to the narrative that's kind of trading around the developed market world. And so I'm just wondering, when do you think that emerging market story works and which emerging <laughs> markets do you like? We've been waiting for a long time for emerging markets to kind of come back. Uh, but the headwinds uh, still towards uh, emerging markets would be the strong dollar, higher interest rates in the U.S. But once that kind of tapers off, I think there should be some uh, outflow from the U.S. market into emerging markets. Uh, China is, of course, the biggest weighting within the EM market. And uh, we, in the case of China, valuations are super cheap. So we think downside is fairly limited. But for China to rise, including Asia, we need to see really very strong policy response, sustained policy response on the fiscal side. Uh, we have yet to see that. But once that kind of unfolds, I think uh, at the same time when the US dollar kind of peaks out, I think that that would be a good time. I mean, I think there's a lot of optimism between the two of you. Um, what might break if yields continue to climb higher? Wayfuck. Uh, 
if yields were to climb a lot higher, it has to be, you know, the result of uh, inflation rearing its ugly head. And if that were to happen, I think uh, you know we would need to reassess the kind of bullish outlook uh, that uh, you know that we are adopting today. Uh, but to see inflation going back up to four or five percent, I think probably not uh, not uh, not going to come to pass. Uh, in when it was four to five percent, there was supply chain disruptions, but today there there isn't. So I don't think we will go back there. So that's the main risk, basically. Inflation. The main risk is also USD exceptionalism. I mean, you can understand if Asian policymakers break out in hives if the dollar remains elevated. We've seen how the yen got to 154, yet no intervention. And we saw how, you know, the Philippine peso is also at record levels. Yeah, I think dollar strength is a concern over time. The, the thing that I think might be quite interesting, and so it sounds like you're kind of open to the idea that maybe these rate cuts won't come, but that, you know, that's going to be problematic in the longer term. And I, look, I'm, you're asking what's the problem with higher yields. One of the reasons I have this view and I'm bullish is that I don't think higher yields breaks anything this year. Ultimately, this no landing will mean a very hard landing at some point in the future. But I think that's just a, it's a story for way down the line and not something you trade at the moment. Um, but I think that the, the, the tail risk that I'm watching for, for changing the narrative, and I think might shock you, is this idea that, wait a sec, maybe the, do, the Fed won't be the exceptional one. Maybe what we're going to need to change our narrative on is that other central banks won't be cutting as much as we think. That I wonder whether our pessimism around growth in the rest of the world might be reaching a bottom. Like, we, we, we think and know that European growth's been terrible, but maybe European growth's bottomed. Maybe European and Chinese growth starts picking up as well, and we get a general tailwind, and we suddenly go, no one's going to cut much. And in that world, dollars stop strengthening. In fact, as people, in, in line with your view, broaden out their risk investments, that's actually deleveraging from the world's reserve currency, or sorry, it's re-leveraging back into the world. And in that world, we actually, without rate cuts, we actually see the dollar start to weaken. And that, that's where we extend the bull market even further. So that's the tail risk I'm more worried about. All right, perspectives to consider. Bloomberg and Live Executive at Demarcat Moore, thank you. Wei Fok Ho, CIO of DBS, is sticking around. Well, still ahead this hour, we discuss spending priorities with New Zealand Prime Minister Christopher Luxon as he tries to tame inflation. Plus, an exclusive chat with incoming Viacom 18 Vice Chair Uday Shankar about efforts to build a media giant in India. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. The IMF has inched up its expectations for global economic growth this year to 3.2 percent. The fund's latest world economic outlook points to strength in the U.S. and some emerging markets, while warning the outlook remains cautious amid persistent inflation and geopolitical risks, and is urging China to find ways to offset headwinds from its property crisis. With an economy that is uh, that has potentially still relatively weak domestic demand, but is is uh, 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 is growing, then there will be an increased reliance on on the export sector, and that is something that, in the context of uh, very uh, tight uh, trade tensions, could be complicated. And so, certainly, that would be uh, uh, you know in the interest of uh, the Chinese economy to develop ways of uh, sustaining domestic uh, domestic demand. And the U.S. has repeated its concerns over what it sees as industrial overcapacity in the world's second largest economy. But Chinese officials have since pushed back against Washington's claims. Our news desk editor Jill Deeses is with us. And Jill, it's hard to imagine that China will change its policies because of the U.S. Uh, no, uh, Haas, it isn't. Look, I mean, they've been um, pretty forceful in pushback against a lot of these claims coming out of the U.S. and Europe recently on industrial overcapacity. Um, we've seen this um, pushed uh, both from the U.S. last week during uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit to Beijing. Uh, we've also see, saw German Chancellor um, Olaf Scholz bring this up uh, as he met with Xi Jinping just this week. And uh, really, I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, really that pushback in terms of, uh, you know, Xi Jinping reaching out and saying, look, um, actually, exports, uh, particularly in you know, the green space, clean tech space, have actually helped uh, drive down global inflation. So really, I think you're seeing a lot of pushback here from China on these efforts. So what exactly did Xi Jinping say about the benefits of Chinese exports? I mean, he did say that it is all due to demand. 
Yes, exactly. I mean, look, I think that what he's saying is that we still have all of this, um, you know, the developed infrastructure to really push out the products that the world wants. He pointed in his meeting with uh, uh, German Chancellor Schultz specifically uh, to China's exports of things like solar panels, things like electric vehicles, and how that's ultimately been beneficial for the world. So I think that's all sort of combining to show you that really uh, China um, is, is prepared to be forceful about this pushback on um, claims over industrial overcapacity that the U.S. and that Europe are pushing right now. Jill Deesis, thank you for that perspective. Let's bring in Wei Fuk Hao, CIO of DBS. He's still with us. He says recent policy meetings in China provide room for optimism. But the question really is whether it is time to perhaps ramp up investment in the market. Yeah, so it's been very disappointing, the stock markets in China, Hong Kong. Uh, but Valuations are really at uh, you know trough levels, and we do see uh, minimal downside. Now, for markets to really go back up, we need to see catalysts, and and really uh, personal consumption, domestic consumption, is the key. We think uh, China has the means to really uh, you know uh, bring about a fiscal policy that is strong, sustained, and that will you know, shift, uh, you know, the, the consumer into a more confident uh, consumer. Mm. Uh, so we, we need to see that uh, before we would uh, add more uh, exposure into China, Hong Kong. What's the best place or how best to play China in terms of exposure to the, to, to the market? Yeah, I think uh, in China, again, there, there are what we call income generating uh, stocks, you know, like the large banks, they pay you a pretty decent, uh, you know, yield, dividend yield. Uh, in fact, very attractive yield. Uh, we do also like the, you know, the technology platform kind of companies. Uh, they are in kind of a very, very weak now, but I think uh, that's the way to be positioned in China. Mm. You know, when it comes to China, it's about regulatory framework. Most of the time, we saw how the CSI 2000, the small caps, took a hit down 11 percent over a course of two days because of concerns of IPOs. I mean, how are you looking at such regulatory environment? Do you read deeper into that? Yeah, it's hard to predict what, what will happen next in terms of regulation. But if you look across the world, it's not just China. Uh, it is the bigger companies, the profitable companies, companies that demonstrate what we call uh, a mode quality that are doing well. Even in the US, you know, the small cap stocks have been lagging big time versus the big tech companies, for example. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite universal. And, and therefore, you know, the way we are guiding our clients is buy into profitable companies, those with white modes, deep modes, strong brands. So these are the kind of uh, companies we think will hold up much better in a down trend, but it will do very well on the uptrend. But why even play China when there are better alternatives like India, like Korea? Yeah, so valuations, of course, is one main reason why I think, uh, you know, you want to be in China. I know all of us kind of got it wrong, you know, two years ago when we said, oh, China will come back. Uh, uh, but the fact is that, you know, it has not, uh, you know, really been uh, falling in, in the sense in terms of valuations, it's, it's, it's really at a trough today. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are not going to add more exposure at this point in time until we see some really strong fiscal uh, uh, response. But as it stands today, you just got to hold on to the best in class companies there and just wait for that. We're seeing continued weakness in the Chinese yuan because of the weak economy. Some suggesting perhaps we'll see 7.3 versus the dollar by the end of the quarter. What are you looking at? Because we're getting mixed signals from the PBOC. So I think it's not a uh, Asian currency or China currency uh, in isolation, but it's really the dollar strength. Mm. Dollar has been strong against uh, the euro, also against the Asian bloc, in particular yen. So that is really a, uh, you know, I would say, you know, all the other currencies in Asia were, were, were also kind of weakening on the back of this. So not, not necessarily a China-specific issue. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, even even as uh, we're speaking right now, offshore yuan, a one-month high ball rising to 5.105%. That's near the highest since 2018. What, what do you make of these movements in the market? Uh, I mean, 5% is still kind of uh, subdued. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, you know, we are that concerned at this point in time uh, of interest rates in Asia, for example, you know, spiking up, yeah. And in terms of Chinese growth, just to continue a conversation, you're still at about 5% for the year. Yeah, so the recent UBS announcement... UBS is at 4.9 and downgraded yeah. uh, that projection. I mean, what makes you optimistic? I think uh, if you 
you look at the long-term drivers of China, I think personal consumption should come back. Uh, you know, the savings rates remain very high. Uh, what is lacking is confidence. So when we see policy response from the government uh, later down the road, uh, I think that will indeed help uh, growth be might, sustained. Might confidence, though, be hit even more if Trump were to come back to power with a 60% uh, tax on Chinese products? Yeah, it's hard to predict what will happen on you know, the geopolitical side. But we have been US there before, elections. Trump in power. Yeah, I think both sides are also kind of uh, in agreement that they want to uh, you know, make life a little bit more difficult for China. But, uh, you know, as you can see from its export sectors, it's very competitive on, competitive on the you know, green energy part of it, electric vehicles, solar panels. So China has, has uh, you know, has an edge in, in these uh, sectors. Yeah. All right. We shall see. Wei Folk, Wei Folk Hao, CIO, DBS Bank. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Bitcoin bulls say the crypto token could hit the $70,000 level before the so-called halving event set for April 19th. Here's a look at what Bitcoin halving really means and how it may affect prices. The Olympics, Sporting World Cups, leap years and Bitcoin halving. They each happen every four years and in the crypto world, halvings typically meant a boon for prices. In a nutshell, Bitcoin halving means fewer new tokens are issued. That's because Bitcoin miners, who validate blockchain transactions, receive 50% less of a reward for doing so. At Bitcoin's launch in 2009, miners received 50 new coins per block. Post the halving in 2024, that'll be cut to just 3.125 Bitcoin instead. In the past, we've seen prices spike following the event. For example, in 2012, when the token jumped by 8,000% in the following 12 months. This time around, the prospect for further gains is unclear. Some analysts say the halving could trigger upside of at least 80%. Others argue the event is already baked in, particularly as Bitcoin's already risen to fresh records this year, which brings to mind a familiar phrase, past performance does not guarantee future results. And that was Bloomberg's Annabelle Jewelers as we check on how cryptocurrencies are doing right now. Pretty much uh, green across the board. Bitcoin, 64.37 right now. Ether also up by 7 tenths of 1%. Bear in mind, Bitcoin reached new highs after previous halvings, helping to mitigate the periodic drop in mining rewards and the increase in the cost of doing business. Of course, uh, the event this month coming after Bitcoin uh, more than quadrupled since November 2022. We're also keeping an eye on uh, Chinese banks. That's on the back of Fitch revising its outlook for Chinese state banks to negative. Uh, Suhao Securities currently down by more uh, than 4%. That drop, uh, dropping the most since 2021 after the CSRC uh, said that it is uh, probing uh, the company. ICBC up 1%. China Ag Bank also trading up. Well, still to come, New Zealand Prime Minister Christopher Luxon says he's determined to get his country's books in order. More on his spending priorities next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. China markets just heading to lunch. CSI 300 index in the positive up 7 tenths of 1%. Still, Chinese stocks recovery stalling somewhat. Investors back worrying about the outlook for the economy. CSI 2000 index, a small cap, uh, recovering about 5% right now after slumping about 11% over a two-day period. Delisting risks spooking investors pretty much. Take a look where we are. Index of the Chinese Yuan, 723.96. Uh, that fixed city was pretty stable after the PBOC loosened its grip on the currency just yesterday. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Morgan Stanley is planning to start cutting about 50 investment banking jobs in the Asia-Pacific region this week with at least 80% of the reductions in Hong Kong as well as China. Let's get more uh, from Bloomberg's Jonas uh, Bergman. Uh, what do we know about this? Well, yeah, as you said, they're planning to, to cut about 50 uh, jobs uh, in Asia Pacific region. Most of them were 80% uh, focused in Hong Kong, mainland China. Uh, again, this is a continuation. We've seen uh, cuts from Morgan Stanley and other big banks 
in over the past three years to their China-focused investment banking desks. This is, of course, you know, due to the geopolitical concerns, uh, the protracted housing crisis in China, and the uh, sluggish economy. The the deal spigots have just been kind of shut off from in both from mainland China and in Hong Kong, and as well as you know the expected business of, of taking Chinese companies public in, in in New York, which was always the big cash cow. So uh, it's a it's it's a grim time to be a, a China-focused investment banker. Uh, right now. You've got to wonder whether we've seen the end of it or the worst of it. Are we expecting more? I, 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 you know, it's hard to tell, but, you know, it's right after the first quarter now, um, so the latest results are in for many of these big banks. Uh, uh, Morgan Stanley saw a 12% drop in, in revenue from, from the Asia-Pacific region. So uh, it's, it's, uh, they're getting down to, uh, to fairly l low levels in terms of, uh, of uh, staffing these desks, so um, we'll see. But, I mean, they, they still all, including Morgan Stanley, still all maintain they are focused on on maintaining a presence in mainland China as well as, as obviously on Hong Kong as well. Um, so they will need, uh, you know, they will need to keep uh, keep staff up should these markets eventually turn around. But we've uh, looked at that for a long time now, and and everybody say that the deal pipelines are, are healthy, but but the deals are just not coming through. But obviously they will need some sort of staffing to to take care of uh, of, of the deals uh, should they eventually start to materialize. Jonas Berkman, thank you so much for that. Now, in the markets, Asian stocks trading in tight ranges. After Powell's hawkish comments, let's do a check-in on how currencies are faring with Avril Hong back in the Lion City. Avril. Yeah, so we're seeing a very interesting picture emerging. The dollar rally after five sessions is stalling. That's despite those hawkish comments from the Fed chair. And in many ways, this is because it's more or less a confirmation of what we got from that red-hot US CPI print last week and causing traders to dial back their expectations of rate cuts this year. That being said, we're still seeing the Korean won, the Japanese yen, they're hovering at multi-year lows. And that has also prompted comments from South Korean officials, they've discussed uh, what they call serious concerns with their Japanese counterparts. Many say that for the yen, 160 is next, and for the Chinese currency, 730 could be the next level we're watching, especially after today, where the PBOC fixed the yuan above 710 for another day. Of course, we're also keeping our eye on uh, the Kiwi on the back of that inflation print this morning. Absolutely. The Kiwi has been a currency that has been sliding along with its other G10 peers since that print last week from the US. It's interesting to see it rebounding today. And let's take a look at the why. It's to do with the inflation print out of the country. Flip the board and take a look at how uh, the inflation on the headline number actually came in, in line with expectations more or less, and easing from the last quarter. But if you take a look at the non-tradables inflation, that shows you that domestic price pressures, those are persisting. And that prompting more analysts to push back what they're seeing on the easing front for the RBNZ, potentially till next year, Haas. Avril, thank you. And speaking of New Zealand, taming inflation by cutting government spending will be a key part of New Zealand Prime Minister Christopher Luxon's upcoming budget. He discussed his spending priorities with us in Singapore, where he's leading a trade delegation to Southeast Asia. I think New Zealand has fantastic potential. You know, I personally think it's the best country on earth, and you'd expect me to say that. But I it actually, is beautiful. I, I, it is without <laughs> doubt. It is without doubt. And I think we have a fantastic future ahead of us. Uh, we have two things that we've got to do. One is in terms of rebuilding the economy. It's making sure we get the cost of living crisis uh, under control for people. Uh, what you've seen is a huge amount of government spending. That's driven domestic inflation, lifted interest rates, slowed the economy up, and obviously puts pressure on unemployment. And so we're working incredibly hard to bring inflation down. We've made some good progress already in the 150 or so days that I've been in power. Uh, you've actually seen, you know, there's no further rise in interest rates. We've seen inflation trending down. Uh, we hope to have it back within our band by the end of the year as well. And that will make a huge difference for New Zealanders who are struggling with the cost of living crisis. You know, um, you know inflation under control, interest rates coming down, the economy growing, and obviously people secure in employment. And then the really exciting work is actually how do we how do we really turbocharge growth in New Zealand? And that for us is making sure that we invest in a world 
world-class education system, embrace the science technology, uh, certainly make sure we build out modern, reliable infrastructure, get rid of red tape and, and, and have smart regulation, but uh, get rid of red tape and green tape, uh, and importantly have international connections to the world, both in a trade and an investment sense. And that's why I'm here in Southeast Asia this week, is just to underscore uh, how important um, the you know, Southeast Asia is to New Zealand going forward. Can inflation continue to decline and ease uh, given what's happening in the U.S., you know, inflation remaining elevated and sticky. Yeah, look, I think you know, in New Zealand, you know, we are very focused as a government. We have our budget coming up at the end of May. Uh, that is a chance for us to make sure that we are generating, you know, good financial discipline and and and, and a good culture of financial discipline. Uh, we won't uh, repair everything that happened in the previous six years of one year's budget, but we are very determined to have a very consistent approach to managing our finances and getting our fiscal books in order. And so uh, we've got a major exercise on with respect to our government. Spending, making sure we're getting rid of the wasteful spending. We think that is the way uh, to support um, certainly uh, lowering inflation, domestic inflation, which then brings those interest rates down and gets the economic growth happening mm. as well. We also think it's important that we're able to offer tax relief to lower middle income New Zealanders as well after 14 years of not, uh, not having any tax relief and we think that's an important thing as well. You talked about wanting to boost growth, yet you're also considering, your government is considering uh, cutting spending at the upcoming uh, budget. Uh, how does that help to revive growth? How does that help the economy? Well, look, we've had an 84% increase in government spending in the previous six years. Uh, and what we've acknowledged and what we've identified is that actually there's a lot of inefficient and wasteful government spending. What we want to do is prioritise and protect our frontline public services, but we actually expect every taxpayer dollar to make sure it generates a return on that investment and it actually delivers for the New Zealand people. And so what we've identified is uh, inefficiencies and savings and wasteful programmes uh, and making sure that we actually direct that, that, that money into repairing our books, but also importantly protecting our frontline services. And that was New Zealand Prime Minister Christopher Luxon. While New Zealand's never surrender approach to inflation has come at a great cost, with its economy suffering a rare double dip recession. Despite this, Bloomberg opinion columnist Dan Moss reckons the RBNs that still doesn't want to talk about rate cuts, joins us now for more. You've got to wonder whether it's all worth it. RBNs and Governor Aidan are pretty stubborn in wanting to fight inflation. Look, I give him a lot of credit uh, for being totally upfront, saying when confronted with evidence of a recession or a looming recession, his response would be along the lines of, yes, and that's exactly what we want to see. Not because we desire it, because we're sadists, but we need it to get inflation down. Now, few central bankers will speak as candidly as that. So what he wants is what they've got. Not just one, but two. Plenty of countries house outside the United States have had some degree of economic weakness in the past year as a result of rapid monetary tightening. I can't think of another that suffered a double dip recession. That's right. And you've got to wonder how much longer he can hold off cutting rates. Well, some economists are sceptical. Uh, they have seen, prior to today's CPI numbers, uh, interest rate cuts coming in the second half of this year. Uh, ben Jarman from JP Morgan, who I cited in my column today, wasn't really expecting much nuance from the RBNZ. They have a preference to be silent, then strike hard and strike fast. It's historically been a bit of a roller coaster ride, but even by that standard, what's going on now does stand out. And, you know, say what you want. New Zealand has become kind of like a gold standard for other central banks as well. Yes, it is a small country, but when it comes to monetary policy, it does punch above its weight and size. Well, there's a lot of history here. So the 90s and the 2000s were characterised by a shift in many economies towards central bank independence and buttressing that independence with a formal inflation policy, generally with a two in it somewhere. Uh, New Zealand was the first. Uh, they like to remind people of that. They're very proud of that. Uh, and all through the 90s, you couldn't go to any conference or listen to any speech by a central banker without some reference toward inflation targeting, which inevitably drew in a comparison with New Zealand. When that trend was in place, it was the gold standard. Now, 
the mandate's become a little bit squishier. Chris Luxon, who you just spoke to, has talked about making it harder again. We'll see it's a coalition government. There'll be some horse trading there. But New Zealand is really standing out right now. They don't want to talk about talking about cuts. You talk about Luxon. His government has talked about perhaps cutting spending at the upcoming budget. I mean, that can't be good for the economy at a time when the economy actually needs stimulus to drive growth. Well, according to the textbooks, if you withdraw uh, some degree of um, fiscal stimulus or some degree of uh, fiscal support, then it's going to dampen demand. Not great at the moment. What I will say is we're hearing pretty much standard conservative playbook fiscal economics here. He said a lot of that during the campaign, to be fair. And it's early days. He hasn't been in government for very long. One thing I have found, though, that once governments become entrenched, regardless of their political persuasion, they tend to like fiscal stimulus when it comes to election time. Dad, what's the sentiment on the ground? How are the Kiwis feeling amid this double dip recession? Been a while since I've been there, Hass, but if you look at the string of indicators, just even in the past week, it's pretty bleak. We've had pretty downbeat numbers on manufacturing, we've had downbeat numbers on sales, we've had business confidence deteriorating. Now, look, these numbers today do show headline inflation retreating noticeably, but on a more underlying level, there's not a lot of evidence that price pressures are you know, budging substantially. Mm. There's a lot of tension there right now. We'll have to see how this plays out. But for now, this looks like an inflation first central bank. All right, Dan, thanks for that perspective. Bloomberg opinion columnist Dan Moss, and with some breaking news to tell you about. Massan said to be considering a record Vietnam IPO for its consumer business. Uh, that Unit IPO could take place in the early 2025, and that's according to sources familiar with the matter. It aims to raise up to $1.5 billion in beer and that noodle unit IPO. Again, Masan, considering a record Vietnam IPO for its consumer business. Well, still to come, our exclusive interview with incoming Viacom 18 Vice Chair Uday Shankar. Hear his outlook on India's entertainment landscape next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Now to the big changes underway in India's $28 billion media and entertainment sector. Once seen as an underdog, Viacom 18 is poised to become a power player with its largest shareholder, Reliance Industries, planning to merge the business with Walt Disney's Indian operations. We spoke exclusively with Viacom 18's incoming vice chair, Uday Shankar, and started with his bullish outlook for one of the country's top broadcast assets, the Indian Premier League cricket. On consumption, we think this year will be even bigger than last year because both mobile devices and uh, connected TVs have grown in population in India. Last year, we had to get people familiar with the idea that IPL was available on Geo Cinema and it was available for free. This year, that message has already gone and the market has expanded, the number of devices have expanded. So we are targeting over 600 million people to come and watch IPL on Geo Cinema between mobile and CTV. This will certainly be the single biggest uh, watched event in one country anywhere in the world. So obviously live sports streaming service is becoming a new norm among like a global OTT players, but it comes with a very expensive deals, like multi-billion dollar deals to get the exclusive streaming rights. So what's your plan to monetize it or like turn this into a cash cow? If 600 million people are watching something in an economy like India with, and the kind of growth that we are seeing in tier two, tier three and smaller towns and villages in this country, there's an advertising opportunity. The problem is that traditionally sports has been offered to only a small set of very premium advertisers who can pay a lot of money. And it's been used as a reach aggregator. That model needs to change if you need to monetize live sports and you know pay top dollars right. and yet make money. You need to make sure that digital offerings are made available to really small, smallest of the small advertisers. And that's the model that we believe in. Will it ever be profitable? Yes. When? We, you know, look, these rights are with you for a very short period of time. In the case of the IPL for five years. 
So we have to make our recoveries in five years. Are you planning any like fundraising or like big or small or like a big size of M&As to bankroll this growth? We'll see how it goes. For now, there is no need for it. The company is well capitalized. The partners have deep pockets and huge commitment. I think we're doing okay. How do you see the competition landscape in India is changing at the moment? India is still so underserved that I think there is enormous headroom for everyone to coexist. As, and the successful ones will have to make sure that you plug into the different segments of Indian society. And it's not going to be easy for anyone, especially for people who are coming from outside. As we have seen, many people have come in and found it difficult to build a big business. But for us, we are from India. We have built businesses that, that have leveraged the power of the Indian diversity and richness. And that's exactly what we think is our biggest competitive advantage. Do you see there will be like competitions to get advertisement, like just to fight against like Meta and Google to secure more advertisement for Geo Cinema? That's the big challenge because right now, you know, uh, Meta and Google have clearly got a monopoly-like uh, situation in India as when it comes to digital advertising. Digital advertising is already at about $10 billion and they take more than 50% of it. And uh, television advertising, on the other hand, is just about three or four billion, is less than four billion dollar actually. So it's already much bigger. The question is, can you mount an effective challenge to these two companies? It's important for the country, it's important for society, and it's important for the people, you know, because otherwise they will not have choices. So it's important for us to put up capabilities and, and, and build technology that allows us to compete effectively with these, uh, these giants. And that was incoming Viacom 18 Vice Chair Uday Shankar speaking with uh, Bloomberg's Sohi Kim. Subscribers can get more from that exclusive interview on the terminal and on Bloomberg.com. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Watching Bloomberg Markets Asia, Elon Musk is expected to meet with a group of Indian space startups on his visit to the country next week. Companies including Skyroot Aerospace say they've had requests from the government to keep their calendars open next Monday for a meeting with Musk in New Delhi. His visit may help pave the way for Starlink and Tesla to break into the Indian market. And our colleague Manika Doshi spoke with Skyroot's co-founder Pawan Chandana about He's expected meeting with the SpaceX chief. You're meeting Elon Musk later yeah. this month when he comes to India? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suppose he said, I want to invest in your company, Pawan. <laughs> what would you say? Oh, we'll be happy to have a person like that, uh, you know, to invest in Skyroot. And, uh, you or know, would you be worried that that amounts to <laughs> an emotional takeover before it's an actual financial takeover? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I don't think, I mean, he's, he's always, uh, you know, encourages entrepreneurs for sure. You know, however, like, you know, he has his big space company to launch all, already, right? So, so uh, I'm sure, like, he would, uh, he would encourage uh, encourage us, but uh, you know, if he invests, it's, it's like awesome. You know, it's so, what's really your good. pitch to Musk going to be? Invest no, in us, mean, or collaborate with us, or uh, invite me to your facility at SpaceX, or what is it going yeah, to be? Yeah, so no, no, we'll just introduce what we are doing at Skyroot. You know, we say we'll say that you know this is. You're playing uh, the modest game now. Come on. <laughs> you know, and, you're going uh, to meet one of the largest entrepreneurs in your sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A sector yeah. that you've dreamed correct, of correct. being in. Uh, you know, since you were a young yeah. adult. Yes, so, yes, you know, yeah. What would you say to no, him? No, no, I will tell him that we are inspired by you, and we build this, and we're going to do an orbit launch which uh, which he is like a big proponent that you know he knows how difficult it is to get to orbit mm -hmm. you know we're do going to do that this year and i'm sure like we'll have his uh, appreciation for like getting uh, where we are today and then um, and then if you want to participate in the journey help us through you know would love to have you uh, on board is probably what we'll uh, pitch but uh, you know we have to see he's, he has his own like wonderful uh, you know launch company out there running really or you could tell him elon <laughs> be careful you know we're coming <laughs> we're coming to get you 
in 10 years from now, right? Yeah. No, no, I mean, uh, so, so that in fact... That could be the conversation as well, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, could be, could be, but I don't want to pitch that to him on... <laughs> no, you don't. You know, but, but when we have not, uh, you know, when we are just getting into uh, what we are doing, when we have to do a lot of things to prove ourselves, so I think that's where we'll want to focus on and would uh, take his, uh, you know, take his, uh, what we call insights and uh, uh, his journey and also his help wherever possible. Well, that was Skyroot co-founder Pawan Chandana with Bloomberg's Manaka Doshi. So all excited about the possible meeting with Elon Musk. Let's take it to markets. It is about the strong dollar story. Well, that strong dollar easing somewhat today, taking a breather already for Asian currencies. But USD still elevated. Yen traders now talking about 160 as the next level. That yuan fix we saw today are pretty steady after the PBOC relaxed on its grip on the currency. The peso falling past 57. That is the lowest since November 2022. And when it comes to the Korean won, uh, losses overdone, says BOK Governor Rhee. Uh, remember that uh, Bank Indonesia intervened after the Indonesian rupiah breached 16,000 just yesterday. Asian policymakers are uh, struggling to put a lid on the losses of the currency because of that dollar strength. In terms of the uh, MSCI asia Pac index, flat right now after five days of losses still set to erase all gains for the year of course traders recalibrating expectations after powell said higher for longer taking away we are in terms of gmm a broad look at how the markets are doing at this point in time we know yields uh, surging in line with the u.s uh, treasury yields overnight touch new highs for the year two years Touch 5% tens at 4.65. Take a look where we are in terms of the Indonesian rupiah down three tens of 1%. And that is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia. Daybreak Middle East and Africa is next. And looks like a sunny day in Dubai after the city saw torrential rains and heavy flooding, prompting flight cancellations, school closures and traffic disruptions. More than 40 flights were cancelled and operations were suspended for 25 minutes at Dubai International Airport, which, by the way, is one of the busiest hubs in the world. All that stemming partly from cloud seeding operations that were meant to encourage rainfall in the UAE. Well, as they say, when it rains, it pours. This is Bloomberg.